I'm curious. I'm excited about being here. I am a doctor in the making. I'm here to explore the unknown. All I know is this is where I want to be. I'm here to get the single best education ever invented. I'm here to develop myself in ways I can't even imagine. This journey makes me feel grateful. I am Brazilian. I'm Israeli. I'm from China. I am Canadian. We basically pushed the reset button. We said, it's 21st century. What can we do that's different, that hasn't been possible? So from my point of view, content is a vehicle for teaching them tools they can use for the rest of their lives to keep adapting, keep learning, keep growing. This was kind of my dream school. It felt like I dreamed how my ideal school would be, and then all of a sudden it existed. I'm just unbelievably privileged to, to be in this position, to have these opportunities, to be a founder. You look around at the other people and you feel like it's this unique combination of our minds will create the first layer of student body in Minerva. I'm so excited that there are people trying to create a revolutionary education system. The fact that this is a new educational institution, essentially teaching you how to think critically, which to me means being able to think for yourself. I've always enjoyed those times in my life when I have the freedom to create my own schedule, to pursue my own interests, and I think Minerva does exactly that. It gives me that freedom. Minerva is designed to be a university as it should be, not as how it accidentally evolved into being. I wanted to be somewhere that challenges me daily, and I was pretty confident Minerva would be that. When I chose the name Minerva, she was the goddess of wisdom. It was an easy choice, because we want to teach the concept of critical wisdom, actually take analytical tools and use them to make the world a better place. We're going to call each of you forward to receive one of these symbols of your legacy at Minerva. And Minerva, much like any school, is not meant for everyone. Do I want to have an experience where I'm not going to be on a campus, where I'm actually going to use cities around the world as my campus? Do I want to go to university where no matter what country I come from, I will be in the minority? There is no majority student. These are very hard questions that students have to ask themselves. Minerva is diverse from all of its aspects. It just fits with the 21st century. It brings students from all cultures and get them to live in many different cultures. We're all very driven in our own area and we have common goals that we want to achieve. There's not a single moment in class where you can actually doze off and daydream, where every single moment you are participating in the learning process. We've hit on something really new, which we're calling fully active learning, where everyone is engaged and everyone is involved. So what we're trying to do is have each session be fully active learning. Think of the fanciest version of Google Hangouts or Skype designed to be a classroom. That's, a, that's what it is. It's very different than a traditional classroom, but in a way it's what a traditional classroom distilled down to its purest form, I feel like, would look like. You are not a passive recipient of your education, you're, you're actually active in it. You are debating and challenging your teacher and your peers. The founding class is in many ways more than a dream come true. These students aren't just brilliant and they're not just students who are pioneers and are willing to take risks, but they are thoughtful. When you take incredibly talented students who at the same time are very hardworking, you wind up finding students who are also humble. And that humility is such a wonderful thing to see when they've all come together as a class. It's one of the reasons why for students from 14 different countries have immediately gelled. They don't let their talent 
overshadow the fact that they really need to invest in order to do something important in the world. There's all these trigger words. Traveling seven different cities, living in San Francisco. I think it's such a great feeling. It's uh, I, I wake up every morning thinking what I'm doing here is is important and could potentially shape the, the outlook of higher education. At the core of Minerva is fluidity. I think that is Minerva's integrity. If it can uphold that promise that as the world changes, we will change. It's your opportunity to tell us how we need to change because you're the next generation. You're experiencing the world in a different way. I'm alive. I am an optimistic realist. I am exploring, founding. I'm a changer. I am a Minerva student. Eu sou um aluno da Minerva. Eu sou um estudante da Minerva. Eu sou um aluno da Minerva. Eu sou um aluno da Minerva. Eu sou um aluno da Minerva. I am a student of the world. Are you a student of the world? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. It's a little bit interesting that the purpose of my talk today is about education and not about technology. After all, this is a e-learning conference. It's about technology and what technology can do for education. But I think that it's more important to think about education more broadly. And only after we have a discussion about what education should be, then we can think about what technologies can be helpful in bringing it about. When you think about most innovative organizations that make truly impactful changes on the world, they rarely think about a technological solution as the starting point. They rarely say, well, I have developed a technology. Now, what can I use to put that technology against? What can I utilize this technology for? But that's, in fact, how most of educational technology works. People develop a technology, whether it's a massive open online course, or an adaptive learning program, or learning analytics. And then they say, well, I have a tool here. And now, what can I apply this tool to? How do I take my technology and use it to enhance, distribute, improve, make more efficient what universities currently do. But there's a problem. The problem is that what universities currently do isn't good. It's not sufficient. And the reason we know that comes both from empirical evidence as well as pure logic. But should education be doing something different? Well, this question was grappled with about 250 years ago in the United States. At the time, the United States were part of the British Empire. And the individuals that would become the founding fathers of this new country started thinking about what a society that isn't inherited should look like. Under the British Empire, in monarchic systems and systems of monarchy, you would be very uh, well-determined, meaning that when you were born, you knew what you would do as an adult. If you were the son or daughter of the king or queen, you would be born to rule. If you were the son of the blacksmith, you would be a blacksmith. Son of a barber would be a barber, etc. There wasn't a great deal of mobility from one circumstance to another. 
In the society that the founding fathers of the United States envisioned, and in fact the society that we have today almost all over the world, your birth does not determine your future. Well, let me take a quick survey here. How many of you here in the audience are today in the career that your mother or father had at this time of their life? Raise your hands. One, two, two <laughs> out of a thousand. This is the vision of the Founding Fathers of the United States. The impact of their vision is what you all are experiencing here in Korea. A society of self-determination. A society of mobility. Let me ask another question. How many of you in this room, when you were 18 years old, studied how to do the job that you are doing today? Raise your hands. One, two, three, four. Twice as many as those of you <laughs> who had the jobs of your parents, but still less than 1% of you. And so their conception of what a university should be was a university to develop the whole person. Some of the founding fathers called practical knowledge, others called useful knowledge. And this idea was radical. So radical, in fact, that the Founding Fathers had no idea how to implement it. And the closest that universities got to fulfilling their vision was known as the Great Books Program. Universities would select a series of texts, usually written by, in fact, almost all, or all of them written, by white men who had then died, so who had been long dead at the time. So everyone from Aristotle, Plato, Shakespeare. And they would read these great works in the hopes that the lessons of the giants, the lessons of history, will be able to be learned by students and then applied to any form of career that they would pursue, especially those careers that would contribute directly to society, being in government, being in service to other citizens. Now, this is a nice attempt, but unfortunately it's quite flawed. And it's flawed because, and this was not known at the time, the mind is quite bad at a thing called far transfer. Far transfer means that you learn a concept in one context and then can originally find a different context and apply it correctly. Right? I'll give you an example. Many people who study uh, economics study the concept sunk costs. 